Welcome to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Today we are joined by Gloria Negretti McLeod. She's a member of the United States Congress, and it's good to see you. I good recently had you. the honor of interviewing you in Washington, D.C. And it was nice seeing you. Absolutely. And I do want to ask you about an issue that was quite prominent in my discussions, and that dealt with immigration reform. Now, when I was speaking with members about immigration reform, this was about a month or so, it seemed as if there was a consensus building amongst Democrats and at least Western state Republicans to get a bill out of the House that would be palatable to all sides. It seems as if that that has hit a bit of a bump. Is that fair to say? Is, that, is my analysis off? Um, I think so. I think it's what people say in their home districts mm. and what they do in the Congress. It's kind of like in Sacramento, what you right. do, what you say. Recently, there was an amendment that passed, and it was sponsored by a congressman from Iowa, Stephen King, who is known for his positions against immigration reform. And it would defund President Obama's Deferred Action Program, which is the Dream Act program, the, the, which the right, young people, right, which allows those brought to the country without papers as children to avoid deportation. The amendment came to the floor suddenly, it passed, some saw it as a surprise. What's your sense of what this event does in terms of the entire immigration reform debate? Well, we thought that in the Congress, in the House, that we had kind of a consensus that immigration reform is something that, as you said, that mm. everybody was going to push and it was going to, we, we knew that there's going to be people that, that didn't want this particular um, legislation. However, we thought everybody was on board, but when this amendment came on the floor, it was kind of a shock to many people. So thereby, the Democrats all voted no on the amendment. And then when the bill in chief came, which was security, right. uh, then every Democrat voted no. Ultimately, though... Probably almost all. I would right. say almost all. Ultimately, though, the measure in chief passed. Yes. It is a Republican-controlled Congress, House, uh, presumably it would go to the Senate. We're not sure what would happen there, but the Democrats do control the Senate. It could wind up uh, at the uh, president's desk. Presumably he would veto it because it defunds a program he supports. That being said, it really begs the question. There seems to be, and this is my personal view, just looking as an outsider, that the Senate, both Democrats and Republicans, are coming to some consensus on immigration reform. Whether they can get to 60 votes, I don't know, as required by filibuster rules. But in the House, the divisions seem mighty. I, it was, it's much larger. It was much larger. Of course, you have 100 people in the Senate. You have 435 now in the Congress. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole lot more people that you have to come over and, and massage and get, get to to where you come to consensus. When I was speaking with your colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle, many, as I mentioned, Western Republicans, I asked them about the discussions they have in their caucus. Uh, because a lot of members of their caucus will not have communities that are interested in immigration reform. But a lot of Republican members do have significant agriculture interests. And we know that agriculture is increasingly dominated by immigrant labor. And so when you speak with your colleagues on the Republican side about immigration reform, are you able, are they hearing that immigration reform is not just about amnesty, as they may call it, but there's a business side to this issue? I think most Californians mm. will agree that immigration is, is paramount to agriculture in this state. I don't know about any other state, right. but in this state, and I'm sure it's the same in other states, but we rely on, on immigrants to, to do those jobs that a lot of people won't. I want to get a sense from you as well about the border, because there is no doubt that to members of both parties, border security is critical. We know that under the 1986 Immigration Reform Act that was passed and signed under the Reagan years, there was a sense that border security wasn't attended to in a, in a proper way. How important is border security becoming as the House looks at immigration reform? Uh, I guess it would depend where you came mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. I think the states that are not bordering the border mm -hmm. are much more concerned about the border than the people that live along the border. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, California has already done quite a bit on the border, but what the border has done 
uh, trying to enforce that has also caused delays in the commerce that goes back and forth. And you know, San Diego and, and Tijuana are almost like brothers and sisters no, I there. Mean, when and I was some of the ones in Arizona, the, some of the, the cities in, right. in Texas are kind of the same way. Right. I spoke with Susan Davis, one of your colleagues who is very who much, right, who represents San Diego and is very interested in creating those business relationships between the two communities. Speaking of business, if I may, I want to shift gears a bit and talk about health care reform. There's no doubt that what we know as the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is on its way. I mean, provisions, we are, we, please. By, by October, everybody has to already been signed up. Right. In January of next year, so 2014, right. then the, the whole health care act is implemented. So I'm going to have a workshop in August. Excellent. A, a town hall. Do you know where yet? Not yet. We okay. don't, we're not sure where, no problem. to kind of all that. So everybody see, all of us, Right. are very excited about this. But ask me how many people have called about this issue. Ask As me. compared to canine issues. Because yes. I think ask, in D.C., yes, how yes. many people have called about the Affordable Care Act? Zero. How and many people have called about concerns about animals? Well, I had not, not too many calls, but we had 3,000 calls about... Calls, calls about the horse meat. Horse meat, right. Yes. Yeah, horse meat. 3,000... Right. On emails, horse meat? On horse meat. And zero on, on the Affordable Care Act. In my district. Right. I don't know about anybody no, else's but, district. But, but that, that says that people are either not paying attention or don't even know what to ask. And of course, you know, each state is responsible for setting up their exchanges. California was way in the avant-garde before anybody else, and we already have exchanges. Cover so, California is off and running. I mean, they, are, they have already found which providers are going to participate. I know they're going to start running ads. And you know the the uh, the chatter out there is that it's going to be out of sight, outrageous. And yet yes. all of the insurance companies have put out their data, and it's actually going to be more affordable than what everybody was saying. It's interesting. I have read articles which suggest that overall premiums will go down. I've also seen some analysis which suggests that maybe for young people, premiums could go up. For those that are not young, maybe go down. In uh, order for all of them to stay down, is they're going to have a lot of health. They're going to need a lot of healthy people to join those pools. And let's talk about people joining pools and joining insurance. You represent portions of the Inland Empire. And as you know, the Inland Empire, more than many areas of our great state, suffers from a lack of primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. It's a significant problem. Do you know, I know you're in Washington now, do you know if the state is looking to try to bolster its cadre of primary care physicians? Well, I, I think that's going to be an issue because if we're going to get more people that are going to need insurance, you know, uh, probably almost everybody that has insurance currently they're not going to be affected they will not by be this. Impacted. I've learned that. So they have their primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. I belong to Kaiser, right? So I have Kaiser. So I'm not. I'm not worried about that. Uh, and so, but those people that are going to join that that large Medicaid uh, right. area, the, the expansion, the Medicaid expansion, expansion. Of, mm -hmm. of all of this insurance, they're going to have to have providers. Right. And so, where are we going to get the providers? And you know, when we had our our difficulty here in the state. A whole lot of people didn't want to do it because the Medi-Cal reimbursement rates were so low. Right. A lot of doctors and, 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 and people just dropped out. And right now, I believe that the California reimbursement rate for Medi-Cal is 50th out of 50. Mm -hmm. I know there is an effort in Sacramento. You're no longer there but to the increase price. that with a surplus. It's okay. I, I look on, online I know every day to read all no, of the news. I know you do. So um, given that your constituents seem to be silent, about this question of the Affordable Care but Act. But they're going to have to come on board, right. and so we're going to make as much noise as we possibly can. And they're going to be able to, to access uh, my website so that right. they, they could get information that way. And that's your goal. I follow you on Twitter, and I see you're constantly putting out information yeah. about the Affordable Care Act. Well, we want to make sure people are aware of it, because it's going to hit them like a door hitting them in the face. Literally. And they're going to say, I didn't know this was coming. <laughs> Her name is Gloria Negretti McLeod. She's a member of the United States Congress. My name is Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California Edition. In what year did the federal government launch the Medicaid program? 1963, 65, 68, or 70? Launched in 1965, Medicaid currently covers 60 million Americans a year, costing $500 billion annually. 
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brian Pomerantz. We are joined by Stephen Nash. He is the court executive officer for the San Bernardino County Superior Court System. And I want to speak with you both about San Bernardino County as well as California in general. There is no doubt that California courts are facing a cash crisis. It's well documented in the media. Give us a sense of how dramatic that cash crisis is and has been over the last five years. Yeah, so we've had, uh, like all areas in state government, uh, major cuts. Um, One billion dollars has been cut out of the out of the court funding budget over the last several years. One billion dollars. One billion. Is now, that a significant portion? It is. When you're talking about a three to three and a half billion dollar budget, and then, uh, but there were offsets. Uh, two of the things that that were put into place were. Uh, by the legislature that money could be transferred from facility funding and technology and and other things. The second component was fee increases. So uh, we've had fee increase of between 22 and 52 percent depending on what type of case you're filing. And the question with that is while fees may go up during difficult times, governments looking for funding, that can create a barrier for individuals who want to access the judicial process. That's correct. Are we getting to a point where the courts are a user fee institution? So it's it is increasingly it's serious steps are being taken that are leading us that way but that's only one component and to go to back to the financial situation I told you there was one billion dollars of cuts all of these other measures still leave us with 500 million, half a billion dollars of real bottom line cuts to the courts. And you mentioned the fact that there had been cuts in kind of back office, for example. I'm wondering if, you know, a few years ago, I remember there was this audit that was talking about how the courts had mismanaged a, a computer upgrade. And so it seemed as if it was kind of a perfect storm because the courts became if I can use this cliche, the whipping boy, for mismanaging this computer upgrade. So it just seemed like there was a perfect storm here. The timing for that type of thing is never great, uh, but you're right, right into the teeth of the greatest uh, fiscal right. crisis the state's ever faced. So it didn't help. It certainly didn't help. And um, there, there was a need to restore trust with the legislature and the governor. What's really interesting to me is the Chief Justice recently spoke before the California legislature, and it is rare that Chief Justices will ever speak in public on matters of uh, fiscal crises. It's just, you know, it's almost, you don't do that. You know, you sit and you, you make decisions. Her words were incredibly powerful. She said that California, because of its court funding crisis, may be facing a civil rights crisis. As I told you, I'm a lawyer myself, I don't practice anymore. Those words really say a lot. I mean, she referred to Gideon versus Wainwright. That was a decision where uh, an individual, basically the Supreme Court ruled that an individual is entitled to uh, legal representation. I mean, if she's referring to Gideon versus Wainwright and we're facing a civil rights crisis, this is dramatic. Yeah, so the impact of all these cuts, aside from the increased fees, and you talked about that as being a barrier, um, think about this. So statewide, 22 courthouses in the state have closed. 114 courtrooms have closed. 30 courts have reduced the public hours. So to be able to go in and file, your hours are reduced. Um, Well, what about this? I heard that in Kings County, they held a garage sale to help the courts. A garage sale. This is California. This is the United States. A garage sale was held to help fund the courts in this state. I've also heard and read that San Bernardino County has become kind of the poster child for a system that is in severe crisis. Of the 58 counties, this county is really suffering. Yeah, and so all 58 courts have been hammered by the cuts, and we've been cut way too much. San Bernardino is an example of the canary in the coal mine, right. however. I love these cliches. <laughs> there's, there's some unique challenges mm-hmm. that we face. Uh, first off, in terms of the size, geography, um, we are the la- largest county in the United States except for a couple of census districts in Alaska. Right. 
and I, I assume they have, I love Alaska, right. but I'm sure it's probably more yeah. polar bears than yeah. people no, there. 700,000 people, I think, in that state. Um, this county has. We have two million yeah, exactly. people. And then in terms of growth, population, look at the Inland Empire in total. The Inland Empire has grown dramatically over the last 12 years. One out of every four people coming to California the last, four, uh, the last 10 years came into the Inland Empire, San Bernardino and Riverside. And so, we've seen pictures of these long lines at various San Bernardino County courthouses in San Bernardino, in Rancho, in Victorville, out the door lines. Even for jury service, the lines are long and dramatic. And what's also surprising about this crisis is that because of it, in this county as an example, San Bernardino County, you have closed courthouses and courtrooms. And when you're so geographically spread out all the way to the Arizona border, that means people literally may have to drive hours to access courts. That's correct. So the, for, for San Bernardino, we were facing a $22 million shortfall. To give you a context, we had a overall budget of $105 million. Our budget is primarily people. The only mm -hmm. way you do that, get to that kind of a uh, cost, is by reducing people. When you reduce people, two things happen. You're going to have backlogs, and you're going to have to reduce the number of courtrooms. So in a county where the population's been growing, the caseload's been growing, they got the lines going in the, off, in the front office, in the clerk's office, in the courts, um, already backed up. Now you're reducing your capacity to process people. The other thing about this, this, this very huge county that we have, um, a limited public transportation. So there are huge communities of, of people that are lower income, disadvantaged, uh, working class people. And so as we've closed in our different phases, we had to close in our first two phases of cuts, our Chino Courthouse, we've <coughs> a Needles Courthouse, uh, Barstow, all but one courtroom, and we're able to keep that open, that one courtroom open uh, through June 30 of 14. Then we won't have money to keep that open anymore. And then uh, we're um, also our Big Bear. So you have our mountain communities that. So does Big Bear have a court? Big Bear Court is closed as of May of this year. Think about that. To get off the mountain is what, an hour and a half? when the weather is good right. and when the traffic is good. But let's think about needles. So that we have communities, needles, which is a, a community out on the uh, Arizona border, right. um, to get to court, it's a, they have to travel two and a half to two, two and a half hours to two hours and 45 minutes to get to court. Imagine trying to get to court uh, if you are a victim, if you had small claims, if you had right. traffic cases or any of that, and having to wake up to get to court by 8.30, how early do you have to wake up? You're gonna travel five hours, and that's if you had a car. Right. If you don't have a car, then you're gonna have to take Greyhound, which means you have to go to Las Vegas, spend the night, and then take the bus. And let me give you one other issue. Please. Um, I just heard a report yesterday. So as of May 1st, uh, as I told you, Barstow, except for certain types of cases, our Barstow court is now closed. We just heard yesterday of the mm. first story of uh, a gentleman that had to take a bicycle six hours riding his bicycle to get to court. Six hours out in the desert to get to court. Uh, are there barriers? Are there access to justice issues being raised? Absolutely. And the other thing, Brad, I want Please. to make sure is clear. We had a $22 million structural hole. That's $11 million we've cut out of our budget. So we have reserves that'll get us through June 30 of 14. As of July 1 of 14, we will have to be completely in balance. So if all everything I told you um, got us $11 million of savings, the mother of all cuts will have to occur in our phase three of cuts. Well, we do then. know that the state is facing a surplus. And so one could only hope, I don't mean to be an advocate, that this issue is resolved uh, so that justice is not denied. His name is Stephen Nash. She is the court executive officer of San Bernardino County Superior Court. I'm Brad Palmer. It's this is California Edition. What percentage of judges in California are women? 27.1, 31.3, 43.8 or 51.2 percent. At the end of 2012, women comprised 31.3 percent of California's judges, up from 27.1 percent in 2006. 
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Paul Zellerbach, he is the District Attorney for Riverside County. And sir, July 1st, 2013 is a very significant date in the life of what we know as prison realignment. Correct. Explain the relevance of this date. Starting July 1st of this year, all the counties in the state of California are now going to be responsible for dealing with all the parole revocations from state prisoners um, who are now the serious and violent offenders. In October of 2011, when prison realignment took hold, what were the counties handling in terms of parole revocations? When realignment first came about in October 2011, all the counties then had to take on the additional responsibility of litigating the parole revocations of the three nons, the non-violent, non-sexual, non uh, non-serious. Mm -hmm. But now, as of July 1st, we get them all, basically. That's a very significant development. I understand the state will be maintaining some control over the most serious of offenses if there's a parole revocation hearing. But as a general proposition, this is now the ballywick of the counties. Absolutely, and we anticipate or expect that it's going to add 300 to 350 parole revocations that we're gonna to have to prosecute and litigate starting July 1st that we never had to do before. And at the same time, I understand that sentencing for revocations is prescribed. Is that correct? Well, it, it's been reduced. Whereas before, a person who violated parole could go back to prison for up to one full year. Now, the maximum penalty or punishment that can be imposed for a parole violation is 180 days with 50 percent good time credits. So it's an actual 90 days in custody. And those individuals will serve their time in counties, not the state. Correct. And again, they used to go back to the state prison system, but now under realignment, they have to remain in Riverside County jails. Or which whatever causes, county it may be. Correct, which causes a further problem in Riverside County because we have no more room at the jails. Well, what's unique about Riverside County, or fortunately not that unique, many counties have this issue, is you are under a federal court order yourself. Correct. Dealing with prison overcrowding. 38 counties in the state are. Right, so it, it, it's a significant development. How is this county, how are other counties planning to deal with uh, litigating the revocations and also incarcerating those that are found guilty of, of, of the underlying parole offense. Well, as I said, from January 1st, 2012, Riverside County uh, jail facilities have been full. You're maxed out. And they remain full to this very day. Mm -hmm. So where they're going to be housed, no one knows. Um, but again, the courts, the DA's office, and the public defender's office are all gearing up to handle these 300 to 350 additional cases that we're going to have to litigate every month. And what's so interesting is you know, I, I absolutely respect all of the deputy DAs. I used to be a lawyer, as you know. But look, if you haven't handled a parole revocation hearing, you haven't handled a parole revocation hearing. And deputy DAs had not been handling those. Correct. So this is a whole new area. Well, it's a new area, but at the same time, the legislation has been streamlined so that we've handled probation violations historically Explain the for difference, years. difference, because it's confusing. It is confusing. Probation violations were people that were sentenced to local county jail and placed on probation. Parole revocations relate to people who were sent to prison and then are subsequently released on parole. For good time or whatever it may be. Correct. <clears throat> so what are you doing? Can you hire more deputy DAs? Can you get more judges into the courthouse to hear these matters? Under realignment, the courts have been allowed to hire a court hearing officer to hear specifically these oh, kinds of matters, which is fine, but in Riverside County, we have the Indio Court, the Southwest Court, and the Riverside Court, and they're only hiring one hearing officer. So one. I don't, uh, one. one. So I don't know how that's going to work out. And additionally, we are hiring the, in the DA's office additional uh, attorneys to handle these matters because we get some state realignment money, but not nearly enough to cover our costs. You mentioned that more money is coming down the pike, and I do want to ask you more about that because Proposition 30 passed, and a lot of focus was placed upon the K-12 element of Prop 30, but there was some realignment money in there as well. What it now is, with, with the passage of Proposition 30, realignment money is now constitutionally guaranteed. The problem is, first of all, there's not enough money in the pot uh, 
to give us. We're getting 25 cents on the dollar. What it used to cost the state one dollar to do these things with, they're giving the counties 25 cents to mm. do the same darn thing. And then also the formula that they're using to divide the money am amongst the 58 counties in the state. Again, Riverside County, in my opinion, is getting the short end of the stick and not getting adequate funding. You mentioned you feel as if Riverside County is getting the short end. Uh, that is a theme I've heard by many people living in less urban counties, both legislators, DAs. There has been legislation floated about somehow changing the way the money is allocated. As you know right now, an organization called CSAC, which is the county association. Correct. They've been doling out the money, and there's just a, a huge sense that the, the non-urban counties are getting the shaft, can I say that? Uh, well, you know, the Riverside County experience is we've been the, the fastest growing county, not only in the state, but in the nation for the past 10 or 15 years. And the money that we should be getting from Sacramento for funding, not only realignment, but many other uh, functions, is not nearly enough or hasn't kept up with that. And I think it's time to do something about it. What about the issue of extended sentences? We have spoken about that, but that issue continues to percolate. And that's the question of an individual is sentenced uh, in, in a state superior court under a three non scenario, but because of enhancements, their sentence, which it was anticipated to be under uh, three years, winds up being 10 or 14 years. Correct. Well, in Los Angeles County, we have an individual who is serving a 42-year sentence in county jail, mm. which is absurd. Right. Um, they're not equipped. They're not equipped. And, Cal I mean, Riverside County is now the fourth county that's being sued by this prison reform group that had sued the state of California and won successfully. Mm -hmm. So we'll see where that goes. But, again, um, I had sponsored a bill along with Senator Bill Emerson to send anyone who was sentenced to more than three years to in custody that they automatically go to prison and now what's interesting in the governor's may revise um, he made that same suggestion so right. he had adopted my idea amen so well, we'll we're see. waiting we'll see how it turns out it, was it going to be a swap it was going to be a, a trade-off right yes the state prison would send a short-time prisoner to the county jail and we would send a long-term prisoner back to state prison there had been rumors um, and I don't want to use that term, but there had been a, a suggestion that Riverside was going to start or had already started expanding its jail footprint. Uh, discussions about Indio possibly, banning possibly, are those still in the pipeline? Absolutely. Okay. Um, Riverside County had received a hundred million dollar state grant to build a j brand new jail facility in Indio. We believe that will be opening in 2016, 2017. Okay. We're also going after an 80 million dollar state grant to expand the banning jail facility uh, by several hundred beds, and we'll see how that works when, out. When, though? I mean, well, the RFP, need... the request for a proposal comes out, I think, September, October. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we'll get the money by the end of the year. But again, these things take years to design and construct and build. I'm wondering with surpluses in Sacramento, is there an appetite to look at whether reform of realignment could actually occur? Because so many bills have been put forward over the last few months to tinker with realignment, and they keep dying. Um, and I think a lot of it's because of funding fears, but also court orders from three judge panels and the Supreme Court. Could the formula start to change I think I think it's going to have to. I've been fighting realignment for two years now with very little success up in Sacramento, but I'm still continuing to do that battle. But in the governor's May revise, he makes a comment to the effect that realignment is not perfect. Right. And that's the first time. And that's time. okay. That, 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 that's, that's okay. Yeah. Nothing's a great perfect. observation. Yeah, right. But um, so I think we'll get more traction up in Sacramento in the, in the forthcoming uh, future. When? Because it is for many counties getting dire. I mean, I'm not trying to take a position, but it's getting dire. It's dire in Riverside County right mm -hmm. now. The sheriff, uh, because he is, is under a federal court order, had to release almost 7,000 inmates early from jail just last year. And the figure this year will be nine or 10,000 inmates that will get released early before they ful now, uh, fulfill their sentence. Presumably these would be lower level offenders, correct? Well, presumably, but as the sheriff says, he's, he has now he's having to release the best of the worst. And that's a scary proposition. Okay. That's unacceptable. His name is Paul Zellerbach. He is the district attorney for Riverside County. My name is Brad Palmer. You've been watching Charter California Edition.